Ciao! Here is a conversation with Kevin Cohen. Dr. Cohen is a professor at the Delft University of Technology. He graduated in aerospace engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and Delft University of Technology, with a focus on spaceflight and orbital mechanics. He then worked as a research engineer at Applied Research Laboratories of the University of Texas at Austin. Subsequently, he pursued an MBA in International Management at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. We talk about how his particular background is serving him in his academic life. We touch on the nature of scientific research and the power and limitations of the scientific method, the responsibilities of academics in society, and finally the influence of artificial intelligence in space engineering. I hope you enjoy it. To support this project, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, connect with me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and support me on Patreon with a monthly membership following the links in the description. So, uh, I reading through your uh, curriculum, I saw you weren't a researcher from the beginning. You did some other stuff in your academ- uh, in your career. And I saw you have an MBA, which is something I'm really interested about. And so could you describe your uh, your path and how you ended up in academia and uh, your MBA? How, how are you putting together your MBA and your academic life and things like this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I've, I've, uh, you have noticed that I've taken a rather uh, non-standard, non-direct path. So I used the, the indirect method to arrive where I'm, uh, <laughs> where I'm at now. Um, I started off, uh, I did a bachelor's in aerospace, specializing in space flight uh, at the University of Texas, also studied in Delft and completed a degree there and returned to Texas to do uh, further research and did graduate work there um, and was very passionate about it. Um, but uh, this is a, an image of how global events can affect a personal life. So um, at that time, the Soviet Union was falling apart and the um, defense budgets in the U.S. Uh, drastically declined. Mm-hmm. And so of the thousands of people that left Boeing and Lockheed and all these other companies, you know, five or 10 percent thought, you know, I've got a lot of experience. Let me go to a university. So at the time, the prospects for staying in academia and research were looking really very, very bad. Um, and so at that point, I thought, well, you know, I, I want to pursue research, but the odds of getting a, a slot doing what I love uh, look very bleak. So I thought, well, I want to do something I love. What, what else can I do with the skills I've built up? And that's where my path diverged because I was, I was teaching at university and really enjoying it at the time. Um, and then I veered off because I thought, well, th- if this is not possible, what else can I do? Um, and I thought, well, um, the skills that I have, I can probably do finance. And that, that's always intrigued me. So I, I decided what's the path to make that happen. I chose to get the MBA. And um, so I went, went and got an MBA specialized in, in international uh, business and uh, finance. Mm-hmm. Uh, to use to use the the not necessarily physics but certainly the mathematical skills that I had built up, um, and so I did that for about eight to ten years um, in Amsterdam and London, um, advising on corporate finance and strategy, but quite different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the process, so the MBA as well as the advisory roles that I was in, uh, you come across things that you don't in a standard. Uh, technical training come across um, different ways of communicating and organizing your thoughts. And so now that I've returned, um, well, over 10 years ago to the academic realm, um, I find that a number of those actually are uh, surprisingly handy um, in the way that I communicate, in the way that I um, come to the point uh, or not, or sell or or convince uh, others of my Ideas. So, so some elements of that are certainly very interesting, even if the uh, the uh, derivatives that you find in corporate finance are rather simple compared to the things that we deal with. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a brief, uh, brief highlight. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, mainly interesting because uh, I've been looking into uncertainty quantification uh, for the last couple of years, and I went through the works of your, I guess, your supervisor, Zebehi. Uh, help me out with the pronunciation. Uh, yeah. Zebehe or Zebeheli, depending ah, on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And was he your supervisor during graduate school? 
or uh, uh, he and uh, Professor Fowler, so Dr. Wallace Fowler, um, were sort of co-supervisors when I was there, okay. um, doing my research. And um, Zebehe, uh, in fact, Zebehe, he he told us to pronounce it Zebehe. Uh, okay. I think he dumbed it down for the non-Hungarian native audience. Let me be uh, polite, um, because I think a, a Hungarian later told me Zebeheli was the right word ah, to pronounce. Okay. But, he said, hey, Zebehe, it was all he, all he said all the time. So um, that's how we continued. And um, the combination of those two, so Dr. Fowler was, was, um, was very creative, a very good um, uh, interactor with, with uh, education, um, guiding projects and things like this. And in fact, he was the first one that tipped me off to using a genetic algorithm in astrodynamics, uh -huh. right when it hadn't been heard of uh, anywhere. Um, so we started playing around with some of those things. And Zebehe is, of course, Mr. Circular Restricted Free Body Problem. So um, we, we had a lot of fun testing out uh, the, the, those two fields and where they crossed. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, uh, early 90s, I guess, you were playing already with genetic programming in astrodynamics. That's right, That's right. exactly. Nice. So um, with, with the, the programming languages at the time, so Python was not at least not mm -hmm. available. Um, so trying it to Fortran, there were some particular challenges in matching the computational tools to the challenge of, of what we were trying. Um, so, but but uh, incredibly stimulating. Um, Zebehe was uh, in his later years at the time. Um, and in fact, in those days, so this is just as the internet sort of started to come online, if you will. Uh, and so most of it was chalk-based. The education, the lectures, the discussions were chalk and a blackboard uh, mm -hmm. and yet for example Zebhe, the way he could magically bring to life the dynamics just with a piece of chalk is uh, just a stunning stunning piece of, of talent uh, mm -hmm. beyond the mathematical skills uh, that are necessary mm -hmm. and do you think you learned that i mean because uh, i remember you you taught me astronomics one and two and uh, I, I remember being inspired by your lectures and do you think you learned that ability from your MBA finance, the things we discussed before, or was it also one or more than one of your teachers that gave you the, and I don't know, at least showed you how you could do it and how and why it was important to do it in a certain way? Um, yes. So in fact, the, I would say that the, my learning in how to convey ideas and how to discuss them with uh, students or, or colleagues certainly came before the MBA. So, mm -hmm. so some of the professors, uh, Dr. Fowler and Zebehe, uh, as well as Dr. Gleason, um, one of my foundational physics uh, teachers, had um, an incredible way of clarifying ideas, as I said, just with a piece of chalk and a blackboard. But the way that that stimulates the thoughts in your mind, the type of discourse um, that had almost almost a Socratic method, but then with with chalk, um, really, really not only excited the mind, but demonstrated by example how to work your way through a, a technical story or a derivation. Um, bringing the people's interest along, but also really focusing on the details right down to the, to the DNA of, of mm -hmm. mechanics, for example. Uh, and so that, that began certainly before the MBA and what, what the, the later education in MBA and further management trainings did is introduce me to different ways of organizing your thoughts, different ways of thinking about um, how you convince an audience um, of the correctness or otherwise of your of your thinking. Um, so one example of that is this uh, this pyramid process that I that I often use uh, and uh, share with students, which um, effectively turns the scientific method on its head. The scientific method is established, well established. You identify the problem, you describe the constraints in a particular problem, you describe your setup and your experimentation, for example. You develop um, and run the experiments, either computational or in the physical world, gather some results, do some analysis, and draw conclusions. And uh, it turns out that outside of the, the academic world that most managers or colleagues don't have time to go through that 
marathon thinking process. They want the answer now. And if you're lucky, they actually want to listen to why the answer is the correct one if you're producing it. So they turn the entire thing on its head okay. and don't want to wait around for this logic. And so this, this combination, this field of first stating what your goal is or what your conclusions were, and then coming with the supporting evidence um, delivers the important information early. And then if someone wants to know more, then you provide further support, supporting evidence um, because somebody will challenge you. And certainly in the scientific community, well, why is this model correct for this situation? Ah, then you go into the detail. Mm -hmm. but this, this different way of twisting how you communicate was, was a real eye opener for me. So it gives you more space to, to discuss with others. Yeah. Yeah, it comes to mind uh, the way in which you structure lectures. So uh, I remember you, you, you began by outlining the content of the lecture uh, and saying, okay, we're going to arrive here. And then you, you, will, you, you will do it. Uh, but it was really catchy to, to hear, okay, now we're here. We're going to do this and this, and then we're going to be here. And here we go. And, and, and then the lecture would properly start, but you will get into it with, uh, with a push to, to see its movement, its, its evolution. So uh, I don't know if it's the same idea, but it sounds similar to me. Absolutely. I remember myself sitting as a student uh, watching various derivations on the chalkboard. And uh, sometimes someone would start the derivation. You'd come into to the lecture hall, you'd sit down and uh, the bell would ring and there, would, there the chalk would start to roll off across. And, and you just were in those days just scribbling down your notes as fast as you could but you had no idea where the derivation was going because it wasn't stated. And so that made it more difficult to kind of create a structure in your mind for the entirety of the purpose and the structure of these, these arguments. So I think that turning it on its head a bit, the story can be very useful. Okay. And how about research? I mean, how do you relate all these ideas and the teaching aspect of your work with doing research? Uh, is there some relation with uh, this this inverse py pyramid in the way in which you, I don't know, came up with uh, works in the past or? Um, it's probably, um, so I certainly use it in the communication and also in the thinking about how I communicate the, the research that, that we do. Um, I think that that one of the things that, that it did is slightly indirect in that um, it allows you to go back and examine the, the assumptions that are being made in, in current approaches and current research and to kind, of, to kind of pick at them and peel them away and say, well, what if, what if we don't do that? Can we, can we insert another theoretical idea or an application idea and approach the problem in a different way? So this idea of, of unpacking what has come before, whether it's the giants on whose shoulders we stand or, or a colleague to pull that apart and really A, understand what's going on. That's crucial to even start, but also to, to open, expose a space for creativity so that you can, um, instead of just doing a cookie cutter integration to propagate a trajectory, that you peel that apart and think about, well, could we do this in a different way? I think that's really essential in, in uh, good research to, to try to break new ground. Mm -hmm. so, so you, I mean, I, I shared this view of uh, doing research really standing on the shoulders of uh, colleagues. Let's not say giants, but let's say both. Uh, yeah. and, and, do, and adding a small piece to, to, to the picture already drawn and uh, saying, okay, uh, I'm going to, we do this by just moving these little things at the at the foundation of the idea, and and the, and the and the in the in the new idea will come out in a completely different way, just changing the small starting input. Yeah, so I, I really, I mean, I got this from you. I remember you you said the, the same thing during the lecture about uh, yeah, what what if we uh, fight with these assumptions, and what what if we remove this piece underneath the, the three body problem. And we say, okay, the primaries are elliptic. Then a new work comes out, things like this. So yeah, really interesting. Uh, I wonder um, how uh, you said creativity plays a role in all of this, um, but uh, is, 
is the historic process of uh, scientific research uh, a deterministic process for you? Meaning that if we are doomed to, to live on the shoulders of giants, uh, are we doomed to, to formalize new questions which are determined by the past or can we be creative in some way? Yeah, so I, I think um, stepping back, I think fortunately it is possible to, to, uh, to be unburdened by all of the assumptions of, of the past um, but it is, it is, um, it's a very challenging process. You see it time and again that um, the scientific community, its purpose is to, to challenge the ideas that came before. And when, for example, Einstein, the tests to attempt to um, disprove uh, relativity, if you will, and time and again, uh, the experimental results agree with what, what he predicted based on theory. And uh, so therefore, one can easily get into the mindset of thinking, well, then this is the model that genuinely explains it. And, um, and then it becomes increasingly difficult to step outside of that. But um, then what happens is someone somewhere decides that, you know, what, but there's something over here that we don't understand the experiments. And if we start thinking about something in, in terms of a quantum process, even if it contradicts with the thinking that came before, that it turns out that that also explains some of the question marks that we have. Um, and so this, this rises out of experimental evidence and we see that um, broadly, but it also it arises out of people's, people's creativity, I think, where they think, you know, um, if, we, if we pick apart this process, if we pick apart the process of integrating a trajectory from Mars to, to Sirius, for example, or from Earth to Mars, well, we can do that via the well-known processes of, of integration uh, uh, to propagate the orbit. But then somebody comes along and says, well, that, that works pretty well and we understand that well, but you know, it takes a lot of time to integrate some of these orbits. What if, what if we actually for, for low thrust orbits decide, you know, this trajectory is, is really, it's, it's a curve. It's not a straight line in non-trivial cases. But that looks a lot like a spiral that I remember drawing when I was in elementary school. Well, there are formulas for spirals. Why don't we pull out a sinusoidal shape, exposins, uh, and just say, you know, we're gonna say that this is the shape. This is our model. Let's figure out what would make it work. And it sort of turns the process on its head. And so I think that's one of the beautiful examples of stepping away from the established way of working and, and trying these new things that sometimes uh, sometimes are fruitful. Um, so I don't know if that touches on, mm -hmm. touches on the aspects that you- Yeah, yeah. I, I'm wondering what's the balance for a healthy researcher to, uh, is it better to read the, 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 the past or is it better to invent new things? I mean, what's the, how do you, say, okay, today I'm going to read more or today I'm going to say the things I read yesterday are not good enough for this experiment. Yeah, so I think, um, uh, of course, uh, you know, there, there are extremes to this. So you can every day try a new approach um, and that may be lots of fun, but not necessarily terribly useful. So I think it's, it's, um, it's a matter of combining when, when when you run into a problem that uh, continuously crops up. So the, the vast global optimization processes can take a large amount of computational time and effort. Uh, and when you run into this, this challenge repeatedly and you think, well, but hold on, surely there must be a way to do this more quickly or more efficiently. Um, then, then you can start to say, well, there's this challenge that keeps cropping up maybe we should step outside of what we've been doing, look at it and see if we can change the problem in some way or introduce something new to address this. So I think it's a matter of being, um, a matter of zooming in, doing, working the science um, and building on it the way we know. But then when you recognize patterns, continuous challenges that come up or difficulties, being able to zoom out again, take a helicopter view and change the problem or your perspective on it. Mm -hmm. I think that, that using creativity as a tool 
not just as a, a random and glorious exploration process, which is inspiring, but not so useful, but using it as a tool at the right moments to, to change things and, and maybe grow the knowledge in a new direction. So it's, it's this balance uh, uh, of finding one's way. Okay. Okay. Trying to take notes. Uh, but yeah, uh, so, so it's not like a, a time-dependent process. I mean, uh, you, you simply step outside 10 seconds, you, you look at it from the perspective, and then you go back in and you try to, to move things in a way that's in accordance with what you saw from the outside, from, yeah, from the perspective. Yeah, and it, it can be. And I think this is one of the things that uh, you know, we notice in, in Corona times, missing our colleagues, uh, students, staff, um, collaborators um, on a personal and social level because we get energy from those sources. But also the, the fact that everyone tends to think in a slightly different way. And so those interactions um, help us to, to jar us out of our, mm -hmm. our, our pattern of thinking and reflect on, on what we're doing. So I think that can be incredibly valuable. And that can be a process of 10 minutes or 10 hours or 10 days where um, you're on vacation and you notice a pattern in nature and think, well, hold on, maybe that model works for the problem I'm dealing with. Um, sometimes uh, very stimulating and useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes back to the, uh, again, the, the question of models in general. So, so um, you know, we don't have a perfect model of, for example, uh, trajectories. Uh, everything is, is a model and therefore they're defined as imperfect. Uh, and so remembering that the two body description, the three body description is a very good predictor, but it's just a model. And so real, they're, not, they're not holy in that sense. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the license to step away and massage the, the problem or your perspective a bit. Right. So I have a question about this. Uh, do you think a model is dis uh, discovered or invented? Because for example, in the relativity case, I'm tempted to say it's discovered. I mean, space time exists even without bodies uh, deforming it. That's my temptation. I would say this. Uh, but for our things, like the two-body problem is invented. I mean, there's no real two-body problem. So how, how do you think about this duality? Yeah, that's, uh, of course, a very philosophical question. Uh, do, I, do I happen to have the answer? Well, no, but maybe a perspective on it. Um, because, uh, well, um, you know, the, the Carl Sagan and, and I think repeated by Neil deGrasse Tyson um, said that, you know, we, we are uh, the universe, the universe is in us, and we are a way for the universe to understand itself. And so, um, so if you, if you think about the fact that the human mind um, is, is a pattern recognition machine in many ways, uh, and therefore, if we recognize patterns, then we can build a model to explain things that, that predicts well or, or poorly. Uh, and so I think that um, the nature uh, of things is there. And my, my feeling is that the, that the models are, um, are, are increasing ability to describe in an accurate sense what is going on. Was the model there? No, I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that if intelligence had arisen another way here or exists in another way somewhere else, that maybe the, the, the models um, would be described in a different way, but that the underlying essence, their meaning would, uh, would of course be the same because the nature is not different. Relativity mm -hmm. works everywhere as far as, uh, as far as we've tested it and understood. Um, so I don't think that the, the models are ever, um, Holy, but then that, it, of course, it depends on what you mean by, by the model. The mathematics uh, will be the same, but it might be described in a different way from somewhere else. Um, you, you see this um, in, a, in a very eccentric sense described in, uh, in the book, The Tao of Physics uh, by, by Fritz of Capra, where, where he compares um, particle physics, theoretical physics, uh, and their description of how things work with Eastern philosophy, with Zen okay. Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, and seemingly entirely opposite poles of our, of our human spectrum. But the way he describes it, in the end, it turns out that 
that um, these descriptions, while using different words and in fact very different models on the surface, end up looking very similar when you get right down to the bottom of it. Yeah, you you, you peel a peel an atom apart and you have protons and electrons and and we further peeled that apart and discovered some subatomic particles. And eventually we end up describing those motions in terms of mathematical patterns. So if you dig deep enough, you discover that, that really our reality describes everything in terms of these patterns that interact. And in different words, some Eastern philosophy says the same thing. So then you get to the question of, well, which, which model is correct? They both seem to be reasonable predictors in some sense of the way things are. Yeah, I know it's a, yeah, it's a tough one, uh, but <laughs> I'm wondering, that, does it say more about the way in which the brain works or about the way nature works? Because maybe, as you said, uh, there, there's a question that deals with this duality, uh, not a question, a statement by Neil deGrasse Tyson that you mentioned, stating that uh, if uh, Van Gogh didn't draw the, the night sky, how is it called? Uh, yeah. No one else would have done it, while if Einstein didn't invent relativity, someone else would have done it. But as you said, if Einstein didn't do it in those historical contexts, because maybe an alien uh, civilization were to formulate, to, to, to deal with the same observations with another formulation, which we don't call relativity, but which may exist. And I also read about uh, information theory people working on ways to go back to I think relativity and try to get rid of the historical constraint that Einstein dealt with and try to reformulate it with more prime principles, more primitive principles. And so, yeah, I don't know what's your take on that. Yeah, so um, so I, I think that, that um, as Neil deGrasse Tyson pointed out that um, that it's more a question of time. If Einstein hadn't discovered them, the reality is of, of the way the universe works is there. And that eventually someone else um, would have uh, happened upon it and been able to describe these things. Um, and so can it be described in a different way? Well, I think that this, this comparison, this eccentric comparison to Eastern philosophy, um, at least hints that describing things in a different way via information theory, which is not my field at all, um, could lead to, to similar insights. Um, of course, that, that takes time. So we have the, the question of searching for a grand unified theory where relativity is a very good predictor uh, for a variety of phenomena, but not all of them. And quantum mechanics tends to fill in some gaps in places where we don't know so much. Um, in, in some ways, that is also a similar effort to describe how things work. And, it, you know, were they bound to be discovered? Yeah, almost certainly in due time. Um, what does that mean? I think, I think for me, that's an inspiring message, which says that, um, as we saw with after Newton came Einstein, we're not done. There's so much more to understand. Um, and... Uh, Einstein um, can be used uh, not only to predict, but also as a way to feed off of, to say, well, okay, these questions, how do we discover more? How do we understand more by looking at what Einstein produced and testing it in, in different ways? And maybe we discover something we hadn't, hadn't thought of before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I have a... a... A follow-up question about this. I mean, it's not really about this, but uh, since you mentioned the, the pursuit of the uh, the theory of everything, uh, there, there was Stephen Hawking mentioning in his book, I mean, not uh, arguing that, okay, we are looking for the theory of everything, but at the same time, we're not even able to find a solution of the three-body problem. So there's a big gap between the, the problems we're able to formulate and the problems we're able to solve. So do you think we should aim, we should work more on trying to solve problems or should we struggle to formulate problems? And that would, as a uh, byproduct, uh, give us tools to solve existing problems. 
Whew. So that's um, that's that's a, a difficult one that I think has to be um, attacked from a variety of standpoints. So there was the 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 idea of, of Gödel, I believe, who who demonstrated that um, that that certain certain ideas, certain problems could simply could not be solved, and you could you could demonstrate, you could prove that it was not possible to solve uh, certain problems. Um, and so that could be a message that at some point we, we, we give up, okay? So, but the process of tackling these problems, defining and tackling the problems, tends to throw off valuable insights that we hadn't thought of before we departed on the journey. So, um, so I think it's, it's um, I think the, the pursuit of, uh, of these ideas, defining the problems um, in itself uh, is, has been demonstrated to be a worthy pursuit over and over and over again. Um, so I don't know if that, that kind of addresses the- Yeah, the yeah, queer. indeed. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, probably it's the only way forward uh, because of uh, the incompleteness theorem by Gödel. I mean, things like those. Yeah, and uh, to say nothing of the, uh, at least at the moment, the current uh, um, increasingly prevalent ideas of, um, uh, well, fake news as a concept. So the, the, the importance of science to, to be able to establish fact that despite challenges proves to be true uh, is becoming increasingly important and not less important. Uh, and we see this now, uh, unfortunately, in, in uh, all around us. Um, and so I think that that's to continue this process, both of, of research and application, as well as the process of establishing truth and challenging ideas is only more critical every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Are there fake news about COVID in the Netherlands as well? Surprisingly, yes. I mean, uh, it's it erupts uh, everywhere, and I think um, uh, you know this. To me, this is this is um, people looking for for meaning, looking for explanations for why things are the way they are. Um, and in fact, you see, <laughs> crazily enough, you see human creativity erupting with these alternative descriptions of why things are this way: burning down antenna towers because spooky things are emitted from them and it gives you uh, it gives you sneezes or, or something. Um, again, demonstrating a human creativity and the desperate need to have trained and proper thinking in a logical way for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and about this, what do you think should be the place for scientists? What, what should we do as academics, as scientists? Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's that's crucially important. I think that we have to um, have to um, con continue the search, but also not forget all the giants upon whose shoulders we stand. Because if you forget about them, I think that you 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 lose you lose the path. We have to we have established truths. Um, we have we understand gravity to a certain level, um, and to suddenly one day decide, you know, I, I think there's a different explanation. The universe is really just um, a stack of turtles. I think everybody's heard this story. Maybe it was Feynman that uh, mentioned this story, a stack of turtles one upon the other and the universe and the, the globe exists upon that. It's an alternative explanation, but doesn't stand up to testing and, and, and sci the scientific method. So, um, so I think that, that scientist roles, um, we have to continue to explore in our disciplines. Um, but I think that the um, that we also have to get out and help uh, humanity to examine and continue to establish truth. So this process uh, should be part of part of the way humans uh, go through life in a broader sense and not isolated to a few specialist corners where great work is being done. Um, but alas, not um, mm. available uh, to the broad public. Um, so I think that, that that is that is critical. I think scientists need to play a more prominent role in um, in establishing how our society interacts with with each other. 
And do you think uh, uh, the internet could be leveraged for this? Do you think uh, the open source way of thinking could be a tool for this? That's a that's a fascinating question indeed because uh, you know a lot of fingers are now being pointed at at the internet and the fact that well fake news spreads because you know there's no single source of trustworthy information you can find any explanation that appeals to you uh, on the internet. On the other hand, you use the words open source, which is fascinating because in eff in effect, science itself is an open source thinking exercise. You share your ideas with the world and allow everyone to shoot them down. So I think that maybe there's, there's the, the start of a solution there that, that this open discourse, this ability to connect and to challenge each other's thinking in a, in a structured way, maybe should be used more rather than, than less where we get isolated into, into silos. So possibly some tinkering at the, the, the interaction with the entire internet uh, is necessary to, to bring this about. Because I think that's, uh, I think that's a really nice, really nice idea. Open source thinking to tackle the yeah. considerable problems that we, we face now and in the future. Yeah. And the, the silos way of working is the finance one, right? <laughs> so... Well, maybe reformulate your question so I can answer it. Uh, uh, I, I read about, uh, as opposed to the way in which uh, research is conducted in, in engineering, let's say, in our field, uh, I read about uh, the way in which uh, uh, algorithms for trading, uh, things like that, for finance were developed in the past, uh, uh, separating people as much as possible, making them develop uh, 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 theories which were as independent as possible, and pick the best one and try to make them as independent as possible. Uh, do you think there's some value in the latter approach for us? Um, I, Having yes, said I, what I, you I, said. I, yeah, yeah, I, I actually do. Um, and it's, it sort of hints on the idea of, of, of diversity. So you, you, you can, if you go too far in the other direction, end up with a uniform description for, for, for the universe. And then you're, you're blinded to everything but your, your own view. So, so I think that this, this diversity, the value of diversity that different ideas can develop independently uh, and then later be, be, be tested or exposed to, to further scrutiny uh, and shared for their value, um, I think is, is absolutely critical. So you know, I, I, I don't think we should end up with a situation where all astrodynamics uh, researchers are in one giant lab in a single place. I think that would be, uh, be disastrous um, um, for thinking and for having these sort of conglomerate groupings of, of um, fairly independent researchers is, is a very important thing. Independent thinking is, is, uh, is, is absolutely a, a critical to part of the process. Mm -hmm. So can we move a bit on your research uh, and the work you've been done lately? Because I, I am a friend of two of your previous uh, uh, thesis graduates. And yeah. uh, they both work on, uh, uh, I would say, the, the follow-up of what you've done in the 90s. So the, the combination of uh, trajectory design and machine learning. So artificial intelligence. Genetic programming is a part of artificial intelligence. But now we have much more tools. So could you describe the way in which you arrived at these ideas and what you're working on now? Yeah. So, um, so um, one of the one of the the challenges with with computation, again, referring back to our our, our discussion of models, um, you know, the way in which you propagate a trajectory is based on a particular model, and some of them work exceedingly well. There's no question. Um, and we've seen how the, the availability of computational power has allowed us to attack uh, astrodynamics problems in an increasingly, increasingly numerical uh, way to great benefit of, of, uh, of our understanding. And um, so now fairly recently, the, the addition of a machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, if you will, a subset um, is, is then machine learning is um, is, is this um, new tool that turns out does a pretty good job of predicting what is a cat and what is a dog. Um, you know, if you have enough 
data and computational power, which is great if you need to know what a cat or a dog looks like. <laughs> um, so wonderful for Google and Facebook and Apple and the rest of them. Um, but uh, if it's so powerful, well, this, this great tool, can we use it in our work? I mean, we've seen time and again how new ideas that turn things on their heads. So shaping shape-based methods, um, turn the problem around and then we look at how that can help us. Um, well, so this is, this is my view on, on machine learning um, is, is, well, there's this, this, this new tool. Can we, does it have properties that we can aim it at some of the intense challenges we face like vast uh, global optimization problems? And um, of course the, the danger there is that, uh, you know, if your only tool is a hammer, then everything in the world looks like a nail. So, right. so the temptation is to say, well, this, this machine learning can do anything. Let's solve it all with, with machine learning. Uh, of course, that's, that, that's a foolish thing to do, but it turns out to be quite useful. So then the question is, well, where in our astrodynamics research can we apply this to greatest effect? And so in, that is in essence, my, the spirit of, of, of the research that we're uh, trying to do to explore these, these avenues, where can it be applied to greatest effect? Um, and of course, this has been done um, to a greater extent in, in guidance, navigation and control in the GNC community where um, it addresses the challenge of spacecraft that um, are far enough away from the earth that directing the actions from earth um, doesn't, arrive, doesn't arrive in time. And so there has to be some algorithm, some intelligence, if you will, on board to allow the spacecraft to do what is necessary. And, um, and so that's a, that's a beautiful place where machine learning, which turns out to be very efficient for certain things, can be inserted into the GNC process um, to, help, uh, to help the challenges uh, um, be, be solved and be met. Um, and so then my question is, well, if we're trying to optimize trajectories and we can do this by brute force, a massive grid search and spend 10 years doing a decadal study. And by the time the decade of interest is over, we've actually found the optimum. Well, uh, maybe there's a better way and who knows, perhaps machine learning can help us. So this is kind of the spirit mm -hmm. of what we're doing. And are you taking something from the GNC community or, I mean, beside the, the core idea, some, some methods? coming from what they've done and applying it to trajectory design or are uh, so, you running in parallel? Yeah, so in, in some cases, um, yes, but, but um, at this point, mostly we're, we're sort of looking at the, the foundation. So you can, you can use um, a machine learning algorithm like a neural network and do a very deep training, generate lots of data um, or pull it out of ephem yeah, ephemeris data uh, and train a giant neural network to do predictions for motion of, of spacecraft or heavenly bodies. Um, and that's, uh, that, that works very well, that's been, been demonstrated. Um, but um, what we see from, from the larger machine learning communities is when they try to identify um, cats or dogs or street lights or whatever it is, um, there, there's been some research in an open AI effort um, to look at what's going on inside that, that black box. And they've discovered that some of the patterns that we recognize visually show up in a modified form within the network itself. You can identify regions where this knowledge is stored. And so, so one of the, the, the challenges I think is to investigate which, which parts of the machine learning uh, algorithm are best suited to which of the challenges in, in astrodynamics. So, um, if you if you have um, if you have a, a shape based method, for example, well, can you can you not only mimic the shape, but can you replace the shape with with an algorithm that doesn't worry about the fact that visually it's appealing to us mm -hmm. as uh, as an expose in as a spiral, but comes up with a different model that turns out to explain the, the, the problem quite well anyway, given the right choice of coordinate frames, variables, mm -hmm. and a further description of the dynamics. So, so in, in essence, peeling this apart um, and, and looking at a match between the machine learning tools 
and the particular challenges we face. And in some senses, looking to the GNC community and seeing how they've done that to um, enhance or improve the optimal control uh, approaches, for example, can be very informative um, um, without just mapping them onto what we're trying to do. So really just use that as a cue to how we pull apart the problem and examine it. Okay, I will need to re-listen to this and think about it. Mm. Okay, so, but are you focusing on classification problems or this idea of finding patterns inside the network is useful also for non-classification regression problems? Right, so, so, um, so we're, we're, we're looking at it in, in a number of areas. So one, one is the, the regression. So using um, um, either a neural network or some other algorithm to do the regression, predict the Delta V value based on certain initial conditions and boundary conditions. Um, and uh, at a certain point, you, you, you can develop a fairly good predictor, but it could be that that machine learning algorithm doesn't actually know when the trajectory is feasible. So you can produce a trajectory that according to the dynamics is valid, but um, you know, exceeds the constraints on, on the thrust. So no, no feasible thrust can be generated for this particular trajectory. And so then you, you, can, you can actually look at classification algorithms to try to aid this process to classify trajectories as feasible or non-feasible. And, and so this, this combination, how mm -hmm, do you right. apply those together in a, in a useful way that, um, that maybe is, is more efficient or improves accuracy? Right. And are you driven by existing missions when working on these papers, these research ideas? Are you driven by, okay, we have this mission by the European Space Agency. Uh, there are these uh, requirements, so we're gonna push this research here. Or are you more pushed by the flow of previous research when developing new research? Um, so it's, it's um, so, so twofold. I think it's mostly not based on um, current or planned missions. There are some efforts, um, so some collaboration with, uh, with Goddard to develop um, efficient ways to do a decadal study. So if we look in, in 20 or 30 years from now, if you want to do um, a mission to a trans-Neptunian object, then uh, one generates, if you're doing initial studies, generates a decadal study to understand, at least at this stage, the early stage, to influence the design. Well, what, what sort of trajectories um, would be possible in that time frame, 2040 to 2050? Mm -hmm. For example, um, so this is a way that that uh, that I think it can be useful if you can do those decadal studies without doing a massive grid search, um, but speed up that design process. That could be quite useful. Mm -hmm. Mostly, I would say that we're informed um, by um, by the in intrinsic challenge of uh, of improving the optimization process. So. Um, Equally inspiring and, and motivating are, for example, the collection of GTOC uh, challenges, mm -hmm. uh, the Global Trajectory Optimization Competition, where, um, where they pose an impossible problem and it's <laughs> up to teams to, to, to tackle them, which is just a, a tantalizing uh, activity. Uh, and so that's a, also, uh, for a number of reasons, a very nice challenge because you can validate against mm -hmm. uh, against the answers that were found in those problems, um, as well as um, using previous missions. So the, the Dawn mission to past Mars to, to Ceres and Vesta um, is inspiring and useful because um, it gives us some, some known, known data to compare against um, rather than um, only doing an internal validation of a machine learning method. So, um, if, you, if you generate a good optimizer that uses machine learning, um, of course, we want to know if the numbers that come out at the end are realistic, are, are not just feasible, but actually valid. Uh, and one way to do that is assessing them, comparing them to known, known answers, the GTOC competition or missions that were run like the Dawn mission. Um, and secondly, you can use internal validation. So statistical methods to gain some confidence that the, the process of, of prediction and propagation is, is going well. Mm -hmm. And are you also uh, well being inspired by the flow of research? You said the basic, uh, the basic challenge 
Uh, are you looking also in different fields from aerospace, or is it is it a specific the one you're dealing with? Is it a specific uh, aerospace problem, or were you able to find it you know the, to to find it formalized in different ways? Um, yes. Yeah, so 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 uh, interestingly, the 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 desire to find out what machine learning algorithms can do for us in, in astrodynamics and trajectory propagation um, leads one to, to explore what is ongoing currently in developing machine learning further. And what happens there is then you, you end up finding out what other people have done in vastly different fields to understand um, geological processes or biological processes, which don't immediately map onto astrodynamics uh, problems. And yet the way that they tackle the problem um, can, can spark numerous ideas for how to tackle, tackle our own problems. And so rather than just talking to the neighbors in aerodynamics or flight and control or structures, um, this interest in the machine learning process actually is a, is a stepping stone to things much further afield um, and so I think it brings, brings um, a, a rich flow of ideas from further afield into what we're trying to do. So that's happened a couple of, a couple of times where, mm -hmm. um, where that's a, a stepping stone, a nice link. Nice. Yeah. Nice, really interesting. Yeah, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. It was really a pleasure to go back to my master, let's say, but also yeah. explore some of the new ideas you're having. Thank you very much. Thanks for talking to me. It was a real pleasure to see you again. And uh, I wish you luck in your future endeavors. Thank you.